Hello, I'm Marcus Rilton, and this is the Scots Care Podcast. Scots Care is the only charity dedicated to helping disadvantaged Scots in London through a range of support, including mental health therapy, financial grants, advocacy, sheltered housing for older Scots, job coaching, social events, befriending, and support for children and families. The charity has been running for 400 years to help break the cycle of poverty experienced by some Scots in London. In this series of the Scots Care podcast, I'll be chatting to celebrities and supporters of the charity that have forged a life often away from Scotland and about the ups and downs that can bring. In this, the final episode of the first series of the Scots Care podcast, I'm joined by Debbie Leori, the Scottish writer and illustrator of children's books. Debbie has written over 80 books and is still going strong. We talked about how writing has changed since she started, how her own kids have influenced her as they grew and left the nest. And she told me about one book in particular, an amazing, heart-wrenching story inspired by a homeless man she met on the steps of Waverley Station in Edinburgh. So here we go, for the last time this series. Welcome to the Scots Care Podcast, Debbie Leori. Could you help a fellow Scot in London? Please consider making a monthly donation to Scots Care, where however much you give, it will make a difference to struggling families, the isolated elderly, or a homeless Scot. Simply go to our website, scotscare.com, and click donate. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Marcus. Good morning. Thank you for doing this for us. Happy to. Is your heritage Italian? Yeah, well, it's a sort of, I am a mongrel, so uh, dad, half Italian, half Scottish, mum, a quarter Irish, three quarters Scottish, and I was raised in Scotland. I really kind of feel more Scottish than anything else until I go to Italy, whereupon I have a complete character transplant and feel completely Italian. Very strange. Oh, no, that's nice. I think, so you still feel as if you visit and you still have an affinity with the country? Mm, yeah, mainly through my stomach. I think really it's probably the food more than anything else. I don't speak a word, so I'm a bit of a, um, a fake Italian, I think. I, I like it. I, 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 we used to go there a lot when we were kids because we had family friends there and we were able to go and stay with them. And this is back, way back in the, the 70s, when my mum and dad used to drive us there to Italy and it would take three days and obviously this is before the internet or devices and I was trying to tell my kids this and Noah my boy my oldest boy was saying well, what did you have for the three days I'd say with a couple of binos and that was it for three yeah. days <laughs> and serious car sickness if you even attempted to read them <laughs> yeah and probably no seat belts and probably us fighting like cats and dogs in the back for three days constantly yeah yeah, yeah. That was how it was. I mean, and it was fine. We, you know, like you'd make up games and, you know, I'm saying this, but when we went to Italy, when I was a kid, we flew um, <clears throat> because neither of my parents drove. So there there was a lot of airplanes and an awful lot of, um, I was invariably sick as a dog every time I went on an airplane. And um, as for the coaches at the other end, you know, let's draw a veil. Oh, I know. They were horrible. Well, but you know, I don't think my kids can go anywhere. My kids will say, "Where are we going?" I say, "Oh, we're just going to like a local national trust." How far away is it? Oh, it's about fifteen minutes. Right, I'll I'll get my iPad. You like, what? Well, no, just <laughs> let's look out the window and appreciate the beauty. And do you know what? There was a time when we drove up to Scotland about a year ago, and we came across and we're about. I don't know, we're a bigger Crawford somewhere, somewhere relatively near the border. And it just looked beautiful. And I got so irate with the kids. I actually stopped the car and said, right, devices away, kids. Look at these bloody hills. And just to get them. To... <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah you will appreciate the, the, the landscape. Yeah, you yeah. will. Right, they will I... eventually. It's just you know they're not ready for it yet. I guess. Well, this this somebody said this to me about kids generally. That who was it said this to me? They said the best you can hope to be is a good shepherd. You know, don't force oh, your nice. kids into things because I think my, my my oldest boy Noah is fourteen, and he's choosing his GCSE subjects, and I I, I see so much ability in him, but it's like a tsunami of apathy has just hit him. 
And so when I try to force them into things, nothing happens. And somebody said to me, or I read it, I can't remember now, that you, the best you can do is be a good shepherd. Try and try and eke them in the right direction and, you know, they'll find their path in the end. I hope that's yeah. right. I, th- I I think that is right. I mean, they sort of by nature will resist anything from the suggestions of mum and dad because we are meant to be wallpaper. We're not meant to be major actors in their dramas. Yeah, well, we're recording this to, today, and and it's a lot of a lot of world book days are happening today. You know, the kids, my kids, were going to dress, were going to school dressed up for world book day today, and my my ten year old Rafe had he's dressed up as a golden ticket from Willy Wonka. He'd, he'd managed to stuff it up his jumper, right, because he oh. wanted to do a big reveal when he got to school. All so, right. And so he's trying to f- fasten his jacket across it, and he just looks. He goes, "Look, I look really fat." I look like you, Dad. <laughs> oh, ow. Yes, you do, Ray. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yes, let's, cheers, mate. Oh. Let's, can, I, can I start with a quiz question? Do you know how many books you've published? Um, I know it's over 80, but I have actually... Um, numbers were never my strong suit. And I think after about 50, I just kind of lost interest in counting. But yes, a lot. Uh, yes, I read... I think it was the Bloomsbury publishing website I read over 80 and in the UK alone you've sold 600,000 books at least 600,000 books now I, I was thinking about to publish one book is such a thrill it's such an amazing thrill and you've published so so many do, do you still get a thrill when you see a new one coming out um what do I get it's it's been kind of sidelined that that sort of thrill by I suppose by the pandemic, like so many things in our lives have been. But um, having having had a book come out in the middle of the pandemic was um, an experience never to be repeated. And I think after that, um, every well, I mean, I've only had I think two books come out since then, and um, only that's quite a lot actually. And I've just been incredibly grateful um, that they have been published. Uh, you know, sort of by traditional channels in normal means um, post-pandemic because books that came out during the pandemic were almost impossible to promote for obvious reasons and we had we had this ludicrous um, situation where publication day came and publication day went and the book in question was a book called The Minimal which was um, a book about a child and his lost toy and about growing up and still being attached to toys and the toy still being attached to the child and it was a, the sort of story of what happened to the toy in the intervening years and then I'm giving the plot away but then at the end the boy and his toy are reunited but the boy is actually an adult man and it is honestly you should you know like you need a box of Kleenex uh, to be <laughs> gifted with every copy and I find it almost impossible to read it because it is really very poignant and it is all about just sort of growing up and you know the things we leave behind us and uh, when it came out there was nothing and I kind of expected nothing um, and then a photograph appeared online from I can only assume from the, the publisher's publicity department and it was the weirdest photograph and I just thought for god's sake really you could have tried harder or you could have just not because it was a photograph of my brand new book and it was taken in a gutter with you know sort of trash and fag ends and you know old leaves and you know dirt beside it and it was possibly the least glamorous photo opportunity for a brand new book imaginable it was like yeah we read this and here's what you think of it and it was just after that any kind of publicity and any kind of book launch and any kind of you know sort of um event that is made to mark publication day is a huge bonus and makes me very excited indeed but in a different way I think I've sort of seen I've seen the underbelly and I've seen how unpleasant it is and I'm just like yeah we won't get too carried away by the wonders of publication day ever again I don't think I think what I find is much more exciting is when people um get in touch to say they've read the book you know to their 
sort of two-year-old for the last 54 nights with no <laughs> end in sight and thanks for your book you know it's driving us absolutely insane but our children just absolutely love it that's good to hear or when people are grown up and they write they write to me and they say oh my god he's still publishing books you must be about at least a thousand years old because we had your books when I was you know small and that's really lovely that I love I really like that adults going wow I remember your books when I was little so it's yeah, good I, I, I like that what will you say as, as my friend Alice is a, a crime novelist and we were having lunch the other day and she says oh it's nice just to get out and speak to someone and and be with other <laughs> People, when she'd done this, she was talking about she'd done a book festival in Aberdeen. And she said it was great to go out there. And I, she wasn't looking for someone to feed her ego. She was just saying that she works in isolation so much. Mm -hmm. And then you put something out there. And for somebody to say, oh, I like that. I read that. And I thought you did good work because you guys do work in isolation so much of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it at first, when, when I was first published and I would sort of meet um, sort of grown up somewhat breathless enthusiastic fans I just found it absolutely mortally embarrassing and wanted to you know fade into the wall when somebody was saying how much they liked my work and you know, blah 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 but now um it's just so nice it's so lovely it's that human contact because basically when you're working on your own you know every single working day of your life and weekends frequently um and putting stuff out there, it's like dropping pennies down a well and waiting, mm -hmm. waiting for the splash or an echo of the splash or just something to come back out the well. And it can take a while. It really I, can. Yeah, maybe if we had to look at a positive side, an upside of what we could take from COVID is that I think it did set the parameters of what a lot of people wanted out of their, wanted out of their life. And you talking about the minimal? Did you say minimal? Yeah, I yeah. Like yeah. I like that because I like that kind of angst that it creates for adults that read it because we do forget so much as we grow up. And I think sometimes that makes me so sad. And we, we're always in a rush to go places. And I was coming home with my daughter. I got a four-year-old uh, called Indy. And she had. We, I was dragging her home from school. I don't know why. Because, you know, once we get home, we just do the things. There was no, didn't matter how whether it took 15 minutes or 50 minutes. And she'd stopped in the street to look at something. And, I, and I've been trying to do that a little bit more. I was trying to kind of live in the moment a little bit more and be more childlike in a positive way because I think she wanted mm. to look at something that was dropped on the ground. And I think what kids have got that we lose and I don't like is that they live in the moment a lot more and they appreciate the here and now. Whereas as adults, you're kind of going, next, 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 let's pay the bills. Let's watch some rubbish on the telly. Let's have a drink of alcohol. And yep. we lose the magic a bit. We lose what's important in life. I know it's almost like we have to sort of set a reminder on one of our ever present devices to just <laughs> and be for a minute. It's it's all very uh, Buddhist and it's I mean trying to do that in the midst of a 21st century life is like a council of perfection but it certainly is something to aspire towards and you've reminded me I haven't haven't done that for at least two hours. <laughs> it's about time to reconnect with them. Um, yeah what's here because theoretically and in practice what all that we actually have is the present moment and we're, we're continually forgetting about it because we're either living in the past or thinking ahead to what's next so yeah is that 21st century life or is that the human condition social isolation is a growing and often unseen problem in big cities like london Scotscare's Leather Buddies programme matches a Scotscare volunteer with a client in need of company for a weekly chat to help build back connections. If you think you're on your own in London, Scotscare can change that. Don't suffer in silence. Talk to us at info at scotscare.com. You, know, you, you wrote something which I kind of liked and it's, it says, unto, you, unto your own self be true. And you says, I think this is the best advice for anyone, regardless of their chosen profession. You're a unique human being. Use that as the seedbed of all your endeavors and read books by the thousands. Fill your head with stories. And there was two things that I liked about that is to be true to yourself, I find quite difficult. 
because we're we're so surrounded by so much peer pressure and work pressure and talking to people who we probably don't want to be talking to and being nice to people who we can't be bothered with. And so it's quite difficult to, to be true to yourself and then filling your head with stories. And I just wonder, do you find, do you find it, this is kind of two questions in one, you know, do you find it difficult when you're writing for older kids to capture their attention now, because there's so many more distractions these days? Um, I haven't, I haven't written for older kids for such a long time that, um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not sure how that would go. I mean, the sort of last time I was actually with a, a group of children, you know, sort of doing a sort of session in a school for older, older kids. Actually, it wasn't that long ago. It was last year. I had to stand in um, at a book festival because a friend of mine was ill, and um, first of all, I had to say, "Guess what? I'm not who you came to see." Big disappointment. It's only me. You've never, you've never heard of my books, and I'm now going to have to give you a sort of potted pricey of what one of these books is about. Um, I think, as as writers and illustrators, we tend to occupy a fairly, a sort of not exalted position, but a, a fortunate position in that when we're when we are in the company of the children who we would like to read our books, it tends to be at an event or a book festival or a library thing or a school thing. And the children are primed to pay attention. Um, otherwise, you know, the wrath of hell will fall on their heads the minute the author's gone and the teacher has them all to themselves. So they they do try a bit harder to pay attention. Um, and I think children of all, I mean, yes, there are many more distractions around nowadays with devices, et cetera, et cetera. But children have always been quite distractible. They're a bit like puppies, you know, it's like, oh, a squirrel. Um, so <laughs> it is sort of my job as a 21st century author, meaning having to go meet my, my readers and having to entertain my readers, which was not always the case for writers. You know, sort of, I don't think E. Nesbitt had to go into schools and do this kind of thing. But as as a part of my job, the sort of public facing part of my job, I really have to not, not, just, not just read a book to them or with them or at them, but I have to almost become a stand-up comedian to kind of help the book slip down, you know, with without any sort of children yawning actively in my face or saying, geez, this is crap, you know, surely there's got to be a better way of spending an hour on a Monday morning sort of thing. <laughs> so I do kind of big them up, uh, the books, when I'm in the company of children, but I'm actually writing the thing. I'm not writing it for that audience of bored children in a school on a Monday morning. I am writing it because... I want to find out what happens next in the story. And I'm only really writing it for children in that I'm keeping out sort of um, graphic sex and any mention of Anglo-Saxon swear words. Otherwise, I'm just writing it for human beings who happen to be smaller than I am. I, I don't make many concessions in what I write for, for children's um, vocabulary being you know, at a particular age range. Well, I, I do in picture books, obviously, but when I'm writing for older children, I just kind of tell a story with the language that comes to hand. Yeah. Um, and I do, I mean, my American publisher of the sort of six novels that I wrote for nine plus, the Pure Dead sort of series, my American publisher said, could you possibly provide a glossary for the books? <laughs> just oh, really? for some of the more difficult or arcane Scottish words and I just thought really do you need that so I, I did a glossary um and had a lot of fun with it actually I, it, because it was a very sort of snarky version of a glossary <laughs> just, I, I do do snark at times but um so yeah I've, I've completely forgotten the original <laughs> question I'm so sorry Marcus no I think I we're just talking about you know I think the distractions all around us. And I, I, but I think it's interesting you said that because the pure dead stuff, I think you can read that at any age. I don't think it is particularly uh, child centric. And I think when I look at your uh, uh, other books, the picture books, there's other stuff you've written that's really could stood the test of time, you know, that my kids have had. 
and that mm -hmm. my three kids have had and have independently come to those books without me saying, and now read this book. And I think, sure. you know what, and I think there's something about certain books that you've written and another author that I like is the Richard Scarry. I, oh, I still yeah. think he stands the test of time and um, the tiger who came to tea. That's another one that seems to be, have been around yeah. since, since I was a kid. And I, yeah. and I wonder what it is, but then I do read a lot of, you know, having three kids, I've read a lot of kids books and some of them I get to the end of and think this is rubbish. Mm. You know, and there's a lot of, you just kind of think it falls off a cliff at the end, but the good ones prevail. And I, I wonder what the magic is. I don't know what it is that, like in yours, there's a lot of detail in your illustrations. And my kids love the detail because I think it allows them to go off into another world when there's something lurking behind a tree or something in a bush. Or mm. I think kids like that kind of thing. Yeah. And I think, I think children are very, very acutely aware that they're being talked down to or illustrated down to, you know, sort of nice, bright, shiny, bouncy pictures. Um, yeah, that's that is kind of not really what children need. They they need immersion, I think, and anything that you can give them that will help them become completely immersed in the world between the covers of the book uh, is always to be celebrated. I think. Did, did you grow up as an avid reader? You grew up without a brother or sister, and I wondered whether that made you or shaped you in any way. Did that did that you know? cause your imagination to be even greater were you um, in your own world at that point i think so because right from the start my my parents um when i was very little were very devout catholics so devout that they thought it was actually completely acceptable to leave me on a sunday morning for sort of two three hours at a time while they went off to communicate with god and i was left in my court as an infant Wow. With nobody else in the house and a pile of picture books. And at the time, I mean, I can remember this clearly. At the time, I couldn't read, you know, because I was way too small, but I could decode pictures. So I would just sit there working my way through a pile. I mean, I was really fortunate to have all these picture books, but I would be working my way through a pile of the picture books that my mother had read to me. And I would be telling myself the story based on the vague memories of the story, you know, of, of her having read them, but also prompted by the pictures so I think that very early immersion in um, a sort of visual literacy has stood me in very very good stead and probably completely shaped me as an adult you know I have nothing whatsoever to do with the church but I'm really into picture books that's my that's my kind of church um, and I found my daughters when they were very very little both tucked up in the youngest one's bed. The big one had wearily got out the top bunk. Oh, all right, I'll come down <laughs> and read you. And she couldn't read either. So she was sitting there with this colossal big, you know, collection of fairy tales. I mean, it was adorable. I just, I stood at the doorway and just, I just loved them. I mean, I will always love them so much. But at that moment, I was utterly entranced by my daughters because the big one was reading to the little one but she couldn't read either so she was just making up as she went along and it was just absolutely delightful so I think I do think it's modeling behavior I think if you see your parents reading a lot when you're little you chances are you're probably going to be a reader if you're read to a lot when when you're little you're probably going to be a reader but I think if you're abandoned by your parents <laughs> a pile of picture books and the only means of decoding them is via the pictures that's it you're doomed you're going to be an illustrator <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i think that's all again going back to this kind of always on 21st century society we live in that's that's difficult isn't it where parents are stuck to their phones even the evening and we don't mm. read as much to our kids and i when when we had our first child i i read every night and and this is a terrible admission um by the time indy came along our third kid our second child, Rafe, our middle child, reads to Indy, and I, I don't remember Debbie the last time I wrote. I I, I read to Indy, which is terrible. You know, well, I gotta... there you go. Mission statement for Friday: read to your daughter. <laughs> yeah, read to it's my. It's such yeah. fun. It is just you know because the the take that a small child has on a book is completely different from the one that you have, and mm. yeah, some I mean some of the best moments I can remember with with my kids were 
just in the reading to them. And that's not because I'm some kind of brilliant parent, because I'm not. I'm as stapled to my um, iPhone as the next person. But I think we were fortunate in that our our youngest is um, is sort of, tw uh, what is she? Oh, dear God. Uh, 25. And, you know, at the time that she was little and her elder siblings were little, there just wasn't the same um, attachment to devices as there is now but it is I just can't help but feel that on our deathbeds we're going to not say gee was I wish I, you know like you're supposed to say I wish I hadn't spent so much time at work but I think yeah. we're probably going to be lying there going I really wish I hadn't spent so much time on my phone oh you're doom scrolling it's, through Instagram and looking at pictures of people's dinners comparing comparing our lives to other people's and suddenly you go God, what time is it? And you realise you spent an hour and a half. Yeah. And you can't actually remember a single thing of it. It could be Sunday football or Monday piano lessons. Whatever a child wants to learn after school hours, Scots Care has grants to help cover costs. Parents can't always find the funds for those extracurricular pursuits, but there's a good chance Scots Care can. Do you think your writing and your illustrating changed as you've got five children mm. as 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 they got older and as they as they came along and they developed as people did you are they in the books oh boy are they in the books well i mean they're all going to need massive um, um sort of counseling <laughs> they're older i'm not joking because of the fact i put them all in the books frequently you know um they were woven it into the books right from the start um there was i mean one one case when my my two elder boys were quite little the eldest one i think was nine and the little the little one was just over one and we were away on holiday in aviemore and their dad had buggered off up a monroe being a hero and <laughs> i was left with the children and my mum who was you know not for going up Monroe's or doing anything um, particularly energetic, and she she was doing something in the kitchen. And my my sons laid into each other, and the big one turned to me and said, "Oh, I just wish he, meaning his little brother, would disappear." And I had one of those. I mean, I I sadly don't have these anymore, but I had one of those flash inspirations of like an entire book, just landed in my head with that one phrase and I was like hold on a minute <laughs> hold on a thought and 10 minutes later I had a picture book text and an hour after that I had dragged my mother and the two children out in the car to find a public phone box this is before mobile phones so I could phone my editor and say I've got this fantastic idea look there's a fax machine in the tourist board in Aviemore how about I write it out by hand and you give me you know a sort of phone call back in this <laughs> call box in half an hour's time that was how it was done back in the dark ages boys and girls but anyway so from then on yes they've been in all my books but the only I think what changed was when um, my two, oh, it's difficult to describe, one of my sons and my stepson together, who were both the same age, and we were all by then all sort of living together in one house because um, my domestic arrangements had changed mightily. And so I had these two 12-year-old um, boys, the eldest one by then had left home, but my 12-year-old's were really bored with the fact that I did picture books. They kind of go, yeah, mum, that's fascinating. Fluffy bunnies, right, <laughs> sort of walk away. And I thought, I, I am failing to fascinate them anymore. They think I'm a boring old fart. I know I'll show them. And I, um, at the time was, I think I was a judge on the Smarties Award. So I'd actually sort of read about 120 wow. um, books for, for their age group you know, as, as part of the submissions and the Smarties Prize, because if you're a judge, well, back then, if you were a judge, you had to do some fairly he heavy duty reading. So my head was full of stories and fiction. And some of it was less than optimal. Some of it was absolutely brilliant. And as just because I was so immersed in that, in that sort of genre of writing, I wrote the first Pure Dead. Oh, really? And I wrote it specifically for my two sons, um, my stepson and my youngest son and 
I wanted to get their opinion of it. And I mean, I would never have written that otherwise if they hadn't been reading sort of books for that age group. And uh, so I pretended it was a manuscript that had come in from my publisher because I thought if I say to them, hey, guys, I've written a book, they'd have yawned in my face. Of course, yeah. So I thought, well, I'll just tell a lie. And I said, so I've been sent this manuscript by um, Random House and I really haven't got time to read it, but they, they wanted some kind of opinion on it. And, you know, I've been reading all these millions of books for the Smarties. Could you help me out here? And they said, yeah, sure. So I printed out a manuscript for each of them, gave them gave them it and sent them on their way. And they both came back to me after and said, yeah, that was really good. And I was like, yes. And I said, I wrote. <laughs> and they both and they both went, oh. Oh, no, really? <laughs> it killed the it kids. It hilarious. They really liked it up until the point they realised their mum had written it. But anyway, there you go. That's, you know, that's how it goes. But um, I, Yeah, so it kind of goes I, back to what you said. We just we just cannot be cool oh, no, in their no, eyes. We, no. we, on the on the on this podcast, we had, had a guy a few months ago, and a guy called Duncan Powell, and he's in Star Wars. He's one of the characters in Rogue One in Star Wars. Wow. And I, I said to my my boys, I said, Duncan Powell's on the, the podcast. And uh, in, and they both went, before I said the guy from Star Wars, went, from Star Wars? Oh, that's so cool. You know, and then they, obviously the penny dropped. But why is he talking to you? <laughs> oh, ow. <laughs> why would he want to talk to you, Dad? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> like you. I know. it's it, But, you know, hang on in there, because in later life, actually, they will suddenly come round because what will happen is one of their friends will say oh god I heard this amazing podcast and it was this guy with the same surname as you doing you know as talking to you know whoever and they'll go that was my dad actually and suddenly their cool quotient will be elevated mightily by proximity to the greatness that is their father that would so, be nice wouldn't it now, you just so have you and patient I you and I have got a mutual friend, Etienne, and Etienne was telling me that there was a story you had wanted to write and never got to write. And was sorry, I'm so scatty on the details because I have these kind of strange email conversations with Etienne. Mm. And it was was it about a, a homeless man that you'd met in Edinburgh on the steps of Waverley? Oh, I did write it. I did oh, you write did? it. You have to understand that Etienne and I met at a fiddle um, weekend where where we were being taught several tunes by the amazing wonderfulness that is Katrina MacDonald, uh, Fiddler Extraordinaire. So both Etienne and I were fairly fried and the only way to survive one of those weekends because being taught tunes by ear requires a degree of concentration that the human brain really is not. Well, certainly the aging human brain isn't really capable of. And the only way to decompress after each session is with, with uh, generous amounts of uh, single malt. It's a <laughs> fact. So Etienne and I had many conversations um, over a bottle of single malt, but I, I did write that book. That book is in print, is published, um, oh. won an award, and was a true story uh, entirely sparked by meeting um, an ex-Kosovo uh, veteran who used to sit at the top of Waverley Steps and um, he was homeless and he had almost, it was almost like his entire CV written out on cardboard boxes and tied to the railings. There used to be railings at the top of Waverley Steps. Um, there aren't railings there anymore, but when um, Darren was alive uh, there were and he would just sort of sit there come rain shine snow hail sleet etc and he had the most beautiful face I think I've ever seen on a human being he he had just a face that if I was a painter I'd want to paint but as a fellow human I just marveled at how beautiful he was and just how impossible his life had become um not not only having seen active combat and obviously having been quite mentally scarred by it hence living living on the street he also had been living on, on on the street for so long that it was almost impossible for him to be rehabilitated and get him into safe housing because as far as i can understand if if you've had to live in you know, 
on on the streets of whatever city for a, a protracted period of time, you're changed in so many ways that actually living in, in um, what I call a normal house is impossible. So um, over time, we would sort of uh, have conversations, and I, you know, sort of apply the universal sticking blaster of giving him money. And I would occasionally come home and say to my partner, "This is desperate. The poor man. It's freezing cold. You know, he he um is too frightened to go into the homeless shelters because the other residents are frankly terrifying." And he was quite a gentle individual and very vulnerable, like so many homeless people are, and. Um, I would sort of say, you, you know, could we, could could we house him? Could we look after him? Could we, you know, sort of, could I just scoop him up and bring him home and feed him and look after him? And um, no is the answer to that because that wouldn't have worked for Darren either. And you know, so time went by and time went by, and I thought, I thought about him a lot, and I thought, I know what I'll do is I'll write a book about him. I'll, for children, because you know that's the only kind of book I know how to write. I don't really know how to write for adults. And I, what I wanted to do was raise public awareness of the fact that you know, you, when you pass a homeless person on the street, they have this huge backstory, and all that you are seeing is the you know, like the tip of the iceberg that's poking up above above the waterline. But under the waterline are all the reasons this massive life history that brought them to this horrendous situation where they end up sleeping rough on, on the streets of a city. So um, I wrote the book, spoke to a publisher, a Scottish publisher about it. He said he would get the Veterans Association involved. He got quite excited about it and said, yeah, I think we want to publish this. So I was absolutely delighted. And at that point, before I drew any pictures or anything, I th thought, right, I'm gonna go and meet up with Darren and tell him that this is his story and tell him we're gonna share the royalties. And it's sort of validation for all the, you know, sort of horrors of war because it was most definitely, is most definitely an anti-war book. And went into Edinburgh and, um, as I was walking out the Waverley steps, you know how Princess Street is slowly revealed to you in sort of incremental stages. And I could just see flowers and flowers and flowers and flowers tied to the railings. And I knew when I saw that, that he was dead. And he died uh, two days before of septicemia, which is completely and absolutely avoidable, but is also you're at high risk for it if you're living rough on the streets. And that was, that was the end of that bit of the story. Um, and it made me, if anything, even more determined to get the book published. And um, at the same time, the Scottish publisher of, of it um, began to get cold feet for, I, I can't even remember what reason. I think financial really usually boils down to that. And I thought, no, this book has to be published. It really, you know, I really want it to be published because, you know, it's all that's really left. Of Darren, he didn't have any children. He had a sort of he had, he did have a girlfriend, but she kind of faded out the picture. His family were you know sort of saddened, but that was it, you know. And he was a couple of pages of newsprint, um, you know, Edinburgh uh, homeless man dies on the streets, uh, and that was it. And so it took about a year, a year and a half, and a lot of hard work on the part of my literary agent in London and various publishers around the UK who all really loved the book, saw that it was um, you know, a very viable subject but had no idea how to publish it. And the bottom line is, had no idea how to publish it and make money off, off it. And then I hit on the idea of working with a publisher that I'd worked with years and years ago when I first began, and it's a woman called Janetta Otterbury and she used to be part of a larger publisher. She was a sort of senior editor at Francis Lincoln Books and she was there for years and I published with her back then and she was always a, a publisher of, ex, of great principle. She would put her principles before the bottom line, you know, any day. And I thought, I'm going to show it to her. And she had set up in business on her own. She'd left Frances Lincoln and had set up her own list um, called Otterberry Books. And it, you know, it's a tiny publisher. They couldn't afford to pay, you know, 
more than about three groats and a halfpenny, but I knew immediately that she was the person who should publish it. And lo and behold, it came to pass. And Janetta loved it, got it immediately, didn't hesitate, said, yeah, we want to publish this. So it is, it's now in print. And uh, I am really proud of it. And I really wish Darren could have seen it, obviously. But, um, you know, there there's sort of some books that kind of stand out from, from the 80 in terms of my thinking. I'm so glad I made that book because I know that it it has heft and power way beyond what, you know, sort of 32 pages of paper with drawings and words on them should have. You know, that there are some yeah. books that can change the world in a small way, and that's one of them. So the whole book is about why war it is just so bad for people but i had to do it in a in a way that a small child could understand it and not have nightmares from it of course so it it's all in there but it's kind of coded in a way that a child can understand and get without you know being too traumatized by reading it so i'm yeah i do love the book and what did you, it was what did you call the book debbie what was the title? Uh, a cat called Waverly, because I put a cat in the narrative so that so that we could so that the story could divide in two at the point at which the young man, after he's been recruited, he goes off to an unspecified Middle Eastern destination. And the um the cat lacking a human to look after it, um and was living in a flat that became part of Edinburgh's, you know, sort of let's knock down everything old and build new things on top of them. So the cat becomes homeless at the same time as the young young hero goes off to war. And I run I ran the two stories concurrently through the book. So you can see what the cat called Waverly is doing and you can see what the unnamed combatant is doing. And they only come come together at the end of the book when the young man is back in Edinburgh at the top of Waverley Steps. The cat has waited for him. Um, I have to say, this is I mean, an absolute fiction because I don't think a cat would do that. A dog, yes. A cat, mm, probably not. But anyway, I had the cat waiting for him in Waverley Station, hence a cat called Waverley because it was the last place he saw him when he went off on a train down to London to, you know, sort of join the army and so they meet at Waverley Station the cat hears his voice coming from the top of Waverley Steps and uh, runs up the steps and finds him so it wasn't until I'd written it I thought oh Greyfriars Bobby for the yeah. 21st century sort of ish but it is also I mean I I can't even remember I mean I did read Greyfriars Bobby when I was about 11 I think and I think it was just too old fashioned for me to really remember very much about it other than the undying, you know. That's all I remember, the, the little dog on the gravestone. Apart from that, I remember nothing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's sort of, it seems fitting for an Edinburgh story that, that it was, you know, sort of set in Waverley Station. Yes, and, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. that, you know, everyone comes through there. Yeah. Uh, usually it's it's such a hub of sort of humanity especially during the festival and I loved drawing it I became a, a sort of lurker in Waverley <laughs> Station me and my camera and my sketchbook because there's so many really beautiful architectural yeah. details all of which I had to learn how to draw I mean I'm not good at buildings I'm certainly not good at trains but I taught myself how to do it <laughs> Even at your stage of your career, you're a well-established uh, writer and as illustrator, you're still learning, you're still teaching yourself. Oh, yeah. I think that's great. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah Debbie, yeah. thanks for talking to me today. It's been, I have learned a lot. You know, what can I, can <laughs> I end this with another quote from you? And it's something you wrote to me because we're, talk, we're talking over email. And so Often in, in this podcast, it comes back to stoicism. And I never thought I was stoic until I started speaking to people. Then, I, you know, I, I stoicism keeps coming up in my life. And I, I like this. We, we were talking about kids and you wrote in an email, with all five of ours grown and gone, it's a very echoey nest. 
full of memories of when they were small and we were younger. Enjoy or blink and you'll miss it. Mm. And I love that. I really do. It's resonated with me since you wrote it. I love it. Thank you very much for speaking to me today. Oh, thank you, Marcus. That was delightful. See you later. Teddy, bye. Bye. Scots Care is the only charity that specifically helps homeless and insecurely housed Scots in London. We know if it's not just about somewhere to stay, so we provide a personalised support package that strives to meaningfully engage clients to address their needs and gets to the root causes of their homelessness. See our website for full details.